Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a tag video. This is the non-fiction on Booktube tag which was originated by Book Olive. Uh, I wasn't tagged uh, probably because not many of you would associate me with non-fiction which is not an unreasonable assumption uh, but I caught Brian at Bookage's version and thought oh, I'll have a go at this. Um, so I think Olive's, you know, Olive is a big proponent of non-fiction. I think a lot of what she reads is non-fiction. I think it's a mixture of sort of to sort of weed out people who do read non-fiction but maybe don't talk about it, uh, but also to encourage uh, the reading of non-fiction. Um, so the first question is, how much non-fiction do you read? So statistically, 18.818%, i.e. 10 of the 100, sorry, 20 of the 110 books I've read this year have been non-fiction. Uh, I'm doing non-fiction November. I've already read one of the books against the prompts. I'm part way through two more. These two, A Thousand Years of History, which is my bath read, and Publishing Manifestos. That is for Truth, the prompt. That is for Design, the prompt. Um, I've done voice, and I will do sport, but I may not get to it this year, and certainly not November, because uh, that book uh, on sport I want to read is currently with my son down in university. Um, two, what kind of non-fiction videos do you make on BookTube? Well, um... There's no sort of rhyme or reason or logic to this. I talk, you know, if I have a two or three non-fiction books that I happen to have read within close proximity to each other, I will do a dedicated non-fiction wrap-up video. Uh, if I've only read one non-fiction book against a whole load of fiction, I will just tag that onto my Friday reads. So I guess last year I probably made two non-fiction wrap-ups and this year I think also two or maybe three. Oh, because I'm doing non-fiction November, it'll be four. Um, three, what's your favourite subgenre of non-fiction? I'm not sure I understand this um, because I'm not a great non-fiction reader. Um, I don't really understand the concept of non-fiction. Uh, I do go through periods of reading lots of popular science books, particularly on things like quantum physics. And cosmology. Uh, I haven't read any this year. Um, but other than that, I will occasionally pick up books on music, particularly on bands that I like. Uh, I did one this year called uh, Our Band Could Be Your Life, which is sort of about independent punk new wave bands in America, many of whom I like and have records of. But I found that a really disappointing book. And I tend to find music books really disappointing. And I've always felt this about music. because I used to religiously read the New Musical Express and Sounds, which are these weekly music papers. And one of the things about music and sound in particular, it's really hard to put into words. It's hard to describe a guitar solo without lapsing into cliché. Um, so I'm continually disappointed by uh, music books. Um, but two, I suppose, subgenres I don't read. I don't read biography, and I'm going to explain more on that in my uh, non-fiction November, because I recently read The Monk of Mocha by Dave Eggers, which when I picked up I didn't realise was non-fiction, because Dave Eggers is one of my favourite fiction writers. And this is non-fiction, this is biography. And I happened to read it in November, so even though it doesn't uh, match one of the prompts of non-fiction November, I will... Uh, talk about it in my roundup of non-fiction November at the end of the month and I really didn't like this because I don't like biography basically uh, I go into why I don't like biography in that video so you'll have to wait for that and the other subgenre I don't like is, is history because I studied it at university and was very alienated by how it was taught at university to the point where I wanted to leave to drop out and in the end I sort of avoided that by a mixture of changing my my major to what was called social and political sciences was much more satisfying and because I started writing stage plays uh, and that kept me going so um, I don't like reading history books um, I have studied a lot of history uh, as a student um, but equally that 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 transfers across because I don't like historical fiction either and I've got a dedicated uh, video as to um, the problems I have with historical fiction based around uh, the wonderful novel HHHH by Lauren Bene, which I love. I'll post a link to that. So I'm not sure, I, I guess I go through, um, so when, you know, what types of subgenre of nonfiction. I don't have one, it very much depends. I go through sort of 
jags of enthusiasm for certain topics or subjects. So, for example, of the 20 books I've read this year, three have been about death, two have been about transhumanism, two have been about storytelling, as why do human beings tell stories, two have been about music, with limited success, two have been about the science of sound, uh, one has been a biography, which is this Eggers book, one is a sort of cross music biography culture book, which is one I was doing for Nonfiction November, which I have finished. Uh, one is about the undocumented migrant crisis, but that was very much, my enthusiasm for that was around the fact that it was written by Valeria Lewis Selly, and she wrote that before the wonderful novel The Lost Children Archive, because she said she felt she had to write it out as a factual version in this non-fiction book called Tell Me How It Ends, and that released her to then write a fictional version. Um, one on politics stroke culture, uh, two about uh, about writers, talking about their craft and their creativity, and one about Alzheimer's, uh, which I read on uh, a World Alzheimer's Day, uh, not as a deliberate act, but the book had just been published, and that was Annie Erno's uh, I Remain in Darkness, and very wonderful that was too. I suppose that's a biography of sorts. Um, so, of those, I would always read books about death, but the two on transhumanism I read this year is because I'm writing something that involves um, ideas abounding in transhumanism, so it's relevant to my own writing. Next year, assuming I finish the work in progress, I won't be reading any books about transhumanism. Uh, I, I, there are two books by writers here, and there's two more books about storytelling. I'm quite anti-story, so I'm always intrigued by books that try and justify our storytelling gene, uh, because I, I disagree with it. Um, so I do tend to read those, although with a great deal of scepticism. And I don't really read about writer's craft and creativity that much, uh, but one was recommended to me, um, which we'll come to. And uh, yeah, in very small doses, I will read other writers writing on writing. Four, do you have a favourite non-fiction book? Well, I have two, really. Um, and they're sort of related. This is called Art and Physics, Parallel Visions in Space, Time and Light by Leonard Schlein. And this is called Physics as Metaphor by Dr Roger Jones. And Physics as Metaphor is basically, you know, when scientists have all these abstruse mathematical equations, we don't know what they're talking about. They feel a compunction to explain it to us in words, which is very nice of them to share the knowledge. And that's when it gets a bit metaphorical, because that's how language works. So something like um, string theory is, is a metaphor. Even a black hole is a metaphor. And Jones is really interesting on, you know, shifting nature of reality once it, you know, language gets its talons into it. And I, you know, I love that. And Schlein here talks about the... Because art, like physics, is all about the art of seeing, you know, what makes reality, what do we perceive, what, what is the relationship between our senses, the data that they process, and objective reality. Now, I think the argument here goes a bit too far. It sort of implies that artists were nearly always ahead of scientists in making these discoveries, which I'm not sure is true, but even leaving that aside, you know, so, you know, the Impressionists saw the world differently to how the Cubists saw it, at least in their art. And these all are different ways of seeing that scientists also sort of encapsulated and embodied and came to. So these two books are really, you know, they stay with me. I reread them very, very occasionally. They've influenced my writing, they've influenced my thinking. So these two, I'd say, were my two favourite. But I have many other favourites in different spheres. So within sort of war, Male Fantasies, Klaus Thuloit. This is a book about the psychology of the defeated First World War Germans who then went on to become Nazis. And it's fascinating. It's a psychosexual study of, you know, their attitudes towards women and foreigners and, and all this stuff. And it's a brilliant book. There's actually a second volume, which isn't nearly as good, but this, this is superb. And... This is a more modern war. This is the war in Chechnya, written by uh, Nikolai Lilin, who's a Russian uh, crack sniper in a special brigade. And the Chechen war was one of the most brutal, uh, nasty, flouting every single thing in the Geneva Convention. And it's just a chilling, brilliant read. 
Um, now, there have been accusations of, Lili, of Lillian's other book, which is called A Siberian Education, which is about him growing up in the in the Siberian society. That was accused of, of fictional elements. And I suspect, you know, there's an element of stretching the truth in here, but I don't care. It's just such a brilliant, brilliant book. And there are there are other books that are important to me. A Fury for God, this is a you know about the 9-11 bombers, you know, what motivated them. Uh, I use this as the basis of one of my novels, which is on uh, homegrown terrorism. It's a it's a brilliant study. It's one of the earlier studies as well. Uh, it came out when was it first published? Uh, two thousand and two. So you know, really soon after. Um, now, interestingly, there's a fiction book by Jared Kobeck called Atta. Now, Mohammed Atta was the leader of the nine eleven um, plotters in America. And that, that does in fiction what this does in non-fiction. So to have read the two, not side by side, because I've read them many years apart, but anyway, just between the two, I just got absolutely fantastic sort of picture of what I needed to study. Uh, An Evil Cradling by Brian Keenan. Brian Keenan was a man who was captured and chained to a radiator uh, in the Lebanese Civil War, along with John McCarthy and others. And it's a brilliant internal sort of consideration of of that sort of sensory deprivation and you know it's a long long term captivity. I've got another book um, on a similar theme, but not set in Lebanon. Where is it? Yeah, in the belly of the beast by Jack Henry Abbott. Now Jack Henry Abbott was a murderer in in this I can't remember which state in in America. I was in, in prison, was pretty un, unmanageable, so they put him in the hole in solitary confinement a lot. And this is an incredible description of his time in, in the hole, in you know, sensory deprivation and having to share the space with his, his faecal waste and things like that. It's extraordinary. So these two sort of have things in common. Sorry, not that one. These two have things in common. So I have lots of favourite books in different in different spheres, really. Um, what do you think keeps people from wanting to read non-fiction? Well, I can't speak for other people. I can only speak for myself. And in all honesty, if I've, like I was talking about the Mohammed Atta and this Fury for God, if I could only read one of them, I would always veer towards the fictional version. That's just a personal preference. As it happened in this case, both covered similar themes and ground and both complemented each other really and increased my knowledge but I just have a preference for I don't know I can't really explain it maybe it's because I'm a writer of fiction but I'd rather see something given a fictional treatment I think part of it is because a lot of the assumptions about fact and reality I do not accept I do not accept there's a single observable objective reality for example so for a book to declare that it is fact I have a problem with conceptually then there are plenty of books which, you know, I don't agree with their arguments. You know, I just I just find holes with it. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. It's just from my personal perspective. So that's another reason that I don't naturally gravitate towards nonfiction. But, you know, it's very simple. I pick up nonfiction books because they're on topics I want to be educated about or I want to increase my knowledge about. And that has to apply to anyone. If you have any kind of passion in life, be it music, be it sport, be it photography, be it fine art, you know, something like fine art, you are better off reading, you know, if you're interested in modern art, you are far better off reading The Shock of the New by Robert Hughes, uh, which is also a TV series that he did. Far better off reading this than some awful novel about a painter. Um, so, you know, occasionally non-fiction can, can uh, outrank uh, fiction, but, you know, it's a hard question. Six, why do you like non-fiction? Well, again, as sort of an adjunct to that, I, when I get disappointed in non-fiction, as I say, it's because I don't accept necessarily the parameters and the assumptions that the book makes before it's even started. Uh, I find holes in the argument because of my perspective. I don't agree with it. This this book is an example of that. The Art of Death, Edwidge Danticat. But I got a lot from this book. 
through opposition to its arguments because this set this book single-handedly set me on my path for my current work in progress it didn't exist before i read this book there were so many things in here i disagreed with that i thought i've got to write my version of of how i see the, the subject of death um but i find i find a lot of non-fiction doesn't even live up to its own thesis or the title of its book you know so for example um, sorry, I have to keep getting up. This must be very annoying to watch. So here, on the origin of stories, evolution, cognition and fiction by Brian Boyd. So, you know, why, why do we have this compunction to tell stories? Which is, uh, as I say, I'm always looking to have that question answered. And none of the books I've read, including this, answer it to my satisfaction. I think, personally, and this is a very um, outlier view, I don't think we do have a gene and a compunction of telling stories. I think we've got ourselves into that position that we need to move on from because, you know, when we were first, when man was first standing upright and was being preyed on by saber-toothed tigers and all this sort of stuff, stories and gods and the supernatural, it was really important in order to share knowledge and communicate knowledge to the tribe that would preserve the tribe. We've moved on from that. We are far more sophisticated, although not necessarily moral, um, species and i think i think the way we structure our stories in the old way of you know play of uh, aristotle's poetics i think i think we've moved on from that i think those types of stories hold us back so i often get disappointed in the arguments and the theses of um of non-fiction but when they hit home and we're going to come on to that i'm absolutely transported i learned so much i'm so appreciative of this has blown my mind, or at least opened and widened my mind. I've been persuaded, basically. Too many non-fiction books do not persuade me, and I really only read non-fiction books that deal in ideas. That's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in philosophy and science, because I'm interested in the world, the world around me. I'm not interested in individual lives and biographies. and I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in sort of trauma memoirs and all this sort of stuff I'm, I'm you know rightly or wrongly I'm motivated by the bigger picture because I can't get past our notions of reality I, I need to sharpen and challenge those all the time so the next question is what's the best non-fiction book you've read lately and that is this sonic flux sound art and metaphysics so this is the science of, of sound and Sound is something we take for granted, and this book opened my mind to the limitations, the limited way I've been thinking about sound, the difference between sound and noise. You know, there is constant noise in the earth because there's constant matter coming into contact with other matter and the sound of impact and all this sort of stuff. But we filter that out as much as possible because we're only interested in meaningful sound, not noise, not din. We want to get rid of those. We only want to hone in on music or verbal conversation or whatever the sound is that we're that we're after and then it it did um after that it, it gave a very good sort of overview of people artists who work with sound not musicians so much although a lot of them are categorized as musicians but basically sort of sound artists in the same way as you can have sound artists or, or whatever and it was something that, you know, I haven't really exposed myself to, to sort of performance artists in sound, um, but just the way they were described here. So John Cage would be the most famous uh, and accessible exponent of that. So this book was just fantastic. Five stars, my best non-fiction read of the year. Um, what's a non-fiction book you read because of Booktube? OK, there's several of those, including uh, On the Origin of Stories, which I was disappointed in, but this other book called Meander, Spiral and Explode, which is design and pattern in narrative. So this is offering different ways of thinking about narrative according to visual shape. And both of these are recommended to me by uh, Roxy at Wreck Me Books and Stuff. Um, so there were those. Maps of Meaning, which I haven't, I haven't finished. So this is, again, is Why Do We Tell Stories? Um, I put it down after 20 odd pages, I will get back to it, but I put it down because it seemed to me, oh, this is going to be young and collective unconsciousness and the fact that we all tell the same stories across different cultures, which, if that's true, I find is a demonstration of our limitation of imagination, not proof that we all have the same stories. 
but uh, inherently that there's some sort of you know we're almost hardwired I don't buy that at all I just see it come back to my argument again of how that is a, a limitation of the imagination um, this was recommended to me by Neil Griffiths uh, who has a wonderful channel which he's no longer updating unfortunately um, what else have I been recommended um, So this is The Condition of Secrecy uh, by Inga Christensen, a Danish writer. This is one of the books I talked about, a writer talking about creativity. This was recommended to me by Elizabeth at Bookish North. Uh, Christensen was a poet, but here it's non-fiction talking about a creative process and some other things that fed into that. Um, and then there's Andrea Infinite Text, who is a brilliant recommender of all books on death. Uh, which, as I said, is my perennial uh, theme. I don't have anything specific to hand that she's recommended. Um, what are some of your non-fiction reading goals? I don't have any goals, but then I don't have any goals for my fiction reading either. It's just not, you know, I'm very much a mood reader. I don't set targets of books that, that I, you know, numbers of books that I want to read. So I just don't have any. Ten, what's your advice for incorporating more non-fiction into your reading diet? Well... In my case, again, it's, you know, I write books and there is a level of research. I must admit, most of my research is done off Wikipedia because I'm not interested necessarily in the depth of facts. I'm interested in the metaphorical value. So if I read a book about insect anatomy, such as the uh, how their eyes, you know, are structured, I'm, I'm not doing it for uh, verisimilitude, you know, for accuracy, for, you know, reality. I'm doing it to extract what metaphorical value I can from it. But there will always be books that I will need more detail above that, uh, you know, which I'm not going to get from Wikipedia. So, as you know, coming back to, oh, I can't find it now. Um, oh yes, so this, which I didn't intend as research, but it turned out to be research. Uh, Edward Danticat on death. So, it depends what I'm reading, which will determine. As I say, so this year I've read two books on transhumanism. I won't be reading any next year, for example. Um, as to other people, I think I can only echo what Brian at Bookie said, really. If you have any passion in the world for anything, sport, music, art, etc., you know, there's some really, really good books. So, for example, Robert Hughes, The Shock of the New. This is a really brilliant overview of all modern art from the Impressionists onwards. Um, you know, if you don't have, if you're interested in that art, that, you know, that, those scenes in art, but don't have particular knowledge. This book is a fantastic overview. For me, it's now only a reference book. I don't feel I need to read more books on modern art. You know, I read this 20, 25 years ago and since I've gone and seen these paintings in galleries and stuff, not all of them, obviously. Um, but without this, I wouldn't have been as clued up. And as I don't think I would have been as interested in modern art as I am. You know, it's one of my passions. So that's what a, a good non-fiction book can do for you. Um, and the bonus question is recommendations of non-fiction booktube channels that you love. Well, I don't think any of these are, are only non-fiction, but they do, you know, preponderance of non-fiction. Um, so I've already said Andrea Infinite Text, who is your go-to person for all things on death. She has a occasional series of, called, of books on the death shelf. Uh, Roxy, it recommended me books and stuff, but as I say, she hasn't posted for six months, so she is a student, so she may just be very busy with that. Please come back, Roxy, because I get more book recommendations off you in non-fiction than I do any other um, booktuber. Elizabeth at Bookish North, who, again, doesn't only exclusively read non-fiction, but she reads good non-fiction. Ah, yeah, that's a good point. She recommended me another book which was this one, You Are Not Human, by Simon Lancaster. And when I say she recommended it to me, we were in the same bookshop together at the same time. She picked it up. Uh, we talked about it. She hadn't read it at that stage. Uh, and on the strength of our discussion, I also picked it up at the same time. Uh, she thought a bit more of it than I did, I have to say. Um, and the last person uh, is Johnny Keane, uh, who is all things uh, Christian religion. Anything you could possibly want to know, and I must admit it's not a... It's not a subject that I particularly read in at all, but he is your man. OK, so thanks to Bookish Olive um, 
and uh, I encourage anyone who does any sort of significant non-fiction as part of their reading diet to, to do this video. I'll post all the prompts down in the box. Okay, till next time. Thanks very much.